Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. If you're hearing this, then you're on the public feed, which means you'll get episodes a week after they come out and you'll hear advertisements. You can gain access to the subscriber feed by going to colemanhughes.org and becoming a supporter. This means you'll have access to episodes a week early, you'll never hear ads, and you'll get access to bonus Q&A episodes. You can also support me by liking and subscribing on YouTube and sharing the show with friends and family. As always, thank you so much for your support. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Coleman. My guest today is Camille Foster. Camille will be known to many of you as the co-host of the Fifth Column podcast, along with Matt Welch and Michael Moynihan, which is one of my favorite podcasts. He's also the co-founder of a media company called Freethink and a former co-host of The Independence on Fox Business Network. This episode was sort of a post-mortem on two other recent episodes, the one with Christopher Rufo and the one with David Hogg. Camille was one of the co-authors of a New York Times op-ed critical of the anti-CRT laws that Rufo had a hand in writing. And it seemed to me that that piece had misrepresented the content of those laws. So we spend the majority of the conversation talking about anti-CRT laws in general, that op-ed in particular, and the wider conversation about indoctrination in K-12 education. Camille worries that these laws, regardless of their intent, will be interpreted to ban the teaching of anything that makes kids feel uncomfortable on account of their race, which would include many parts of American history that kids should learn about. Whereas I assumed that people would interpret the laws strictly how they're written, which would ban a much narrower set of ideas and would be compatible with teaching all the ugly parts of our history. So as it happens, right after we recorded this podcast, some news came out that completely vindicated Camille's side of that argument. CNN reports that a group called Moms for Liberty, led by a woman from Tennessee, has filed an official complaint against the State Department of Education for including four particular books in that curriculum, three of which are about the history of the civil rights movement. And they take issue with the fact that these books portray really just basic images of Jim Crow, including things as basic as segregated water fountains and black people being sprayed with hoses. And because of this anti-CRT law, it's actually very possible that some of these books will be banned. So this is precisely the kind of thing that I was skeptical would happen, and it's therefore precisely the kind of evidence that changes my mind about these laws from agnosticism to being against them. So keep that in mind as you listen to me and Camille disagree about what these laws are likely to do. Had I seen this news before the episode, I would have sounded very different. So towards the end of the podcast, we make a hard pivot and discuss gun control because Camille is a proud gun owner. Many of you didn't like the podcast with David Hogg, because he's not a gun violence expert. And that's true, of course, but I just want to make clear that this podcast is not reserved for experts. If you have 1.1, Twitter, 1.1 million Twitter followers due to your activism on some topic, that's reason enough for me to have a conversation with you. And Camille is also not a gun expert by any means, so if you're upset by that, you can consider this your trigger warning. So without further ado, Camille Foster. All right, Camille Foster, thanks so much for coming on the show. Coleman, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, so um, I've a few people have, uh, fans of my podcast have come up to me and uh, they, they sometimes have the assumption that I'm friends with every guest that I get on the show that there's like a big hangout happening all the time with conversations with Coleman guests This is of course not true, but this is one of the situations where I actually am friends with my guest today. And yes, um, I'd I'd like to think so. Yes. And uh, actually I I think I've told you this before, but the first time I encountered you is um, 
was on jo- Josh Zepp's podcast. And at that time, I was probably a freshman or sophomore at Columbia, um, alienated by the culture of extreme anti-racist fear mongering and starved to hear anybody, uh, you know, speak to what I felt was, uh, you know, a a situation of people just lying on mass about what is true about the level of racial prejudice and racism as, as an obstacle in the local situation of an Ivy league campus. And I heard you on Zeps and I got goosebumps listening to you. I'll never forget. I was, I was walking down Broadway. I, I got goosebumps. I had just eaten a, a burger from five guys. And uh, I heard you give an impassioned speech about, you know, the fact that we've really, you know, like we, we have to plant the flag that we won the battle against legalized white supremacy. And, and just that acknowledgement, there's a lot of uh, sort of evading that acknowledgement in the service of trying to paint a narrative about how racism is everywhere. And there's, there's, there's a real need for a reality check in this conversation. Um, And so that's the first time I, I heard the name Camille Foster. And then a couple of years later, I was, I was happy to finally meet you and hang out with you and, and so forth. Well, I, I love that story um, because one, it just, it gives me hope that this stuff that we do talking about ideas in public um, is consequential and meaningful to people. And it's important to get those reminders occasionally, mm-hmm. like the notes that we get from people who listen to the show, who sort of share stories that are kind of like that is phenomenal but also just really heartened because I've just been so impressed and thrilled and one, just delighted to know you personally, um, but to just watch your kind of intellectual progression and development. And I, I distinctly remember our first meeting um, when we were having a lunch um, or breakfast, I think um, near my office in union square, I think at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember going into that lunch thinking, man, I'm just this, this kid, I'm going to bring him under my wing. And I just, I cannot wait to, to help nurture him. And I left that first meeting thinking to myself, oh, oh, wow. Like we, like we're partners. There are things that I can learn from him. Um, And it was no more this, this kind of desire to, to engage in this kind of tutelage um, but to genuinely have this kind of relationship where it's kind of iron sharpening iron and I'm um, delighted to to know that you regard me as a friend. I, I certainly regard you in much the same way. And I'm always enthusiastic to have thoughtful conversations with you about the stuff that we violently agree on, um, about the places where we kind of sort of disagree and even the places where we have some some passionate disagreements, although mm-hmm. we don't have nearly as many of those conversations as we should. So maybe yeah. we'll mix it up today and get cool. into some of that. Yeah. Um, feelings mutual and, uh, surely most of my podcast listeners will know you from the fifth column. I assume there's a lot of overlap in our audience. Um, I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's on the off chance that you're listening to this, but don't know that Camille has one of the most engaging and interesting podcasts out there right now that, you know, like this, this is a podcast you know, my podcast is one, hopefully people find it valuable. Yours is one that people will find it valuable on all the same topics you're going to find here, but it also just feels like you're hanging out and drinking with your friends, which is an added bonus to me. And it's a, it's an interesting thing where sometimes I feel like I hang out with you more than you hang out with me because (laughs) I listen to the fifth (laughs) column. So I like, I'll like not have texted you in weeks, but in my mind, just be like, yeah, me and Camille hang out all the time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's, the, it's one of the odd things about doing this thing that we do. Like we have relationships with people. I like that you said that like, like relatively like Tony Soprano talks about the mob, you know, this, this thing, that we <laughs> this, do. this thing of us, this thing <laughs> of us. Um, but it, but it is, it is rather odd. Like I have relationships with people who I know in real life, in some cases, you know, I've read them for years and I'm a, a big fan. Like Eli Lake is a friend. Um, and I love to agree and disagree with him. 
Um, and I, it always makes me really happy when like a, an episode gets published and a couple hours later, I get a text from Eli and he's like, hey, that was great. Here's what I disagree with you about. Um, it's, it's, it's great to have those relationships. It also, also kind of weird you out when you meet someone for the first time and the relationship is like very intimate in one direction because they've heard you talk about things and in some cases share very personal things mm-hmm. and you don't know them yet. Um, but again, it's one of those things where you're able to build these communities. Um, and I think that's pretty phenomenal. It's, it's actually the, the really wonderful thing about the moment that we find ourselves in where we've all got these weird studio setups in our homes or offices with lights and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and we get to have these conversations with people around the world and hopefully expand the scope of the discourse and enrich it in some way um, on occasion. Um, and occasionally fall on our faces and make mistakes in public. Um, but we try not to do too many of that. Yeah. Too much of that anyways. Oh, see, there it is. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I've um, been wanting to get you on for a long time. And because I, I've known that I can, I think I've just, <laughs> I've just sort of delayed it because I know I can do it whenever. But don't presume. I will leave right now. That's I will true. just pull the plug should. on this whole thing. I know you, I know you only fly first class. Your time is very valuable. So even for a friend, I'm, I'm lucky to get your time, but, um, uh, I mean the, the, the occasion I, 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 the immediate, uh, proximate cause of, of me getting you on. And now at this moment is that, uh, I had Christopher Rufo on a few, uh, weeks ago to discuss critical race theory, uh, bands and, um, you know, so there, there's this, this problem that I think a lot of my listeners care about and that I care about, which is, uh, you know, an ideology of you know, racial essentialism, just talking about people as collectives, judging by skin color, uh, as opposed to individual character, uh, character that, you know, is, is a, is a, very much what I, what we have, you know, bonded over and gotten to know each other over both being, uh, you, you might say black presenting people. Uh, I don't, I don't know how you describe yourself, but that, that go against the, the presumption, uh, the, the sort of presumed belief system one is supposed to have as a good thinking black person, namely, um, you know, America is fundamentally racist. White supremacy is the, you know, the, it's just the, 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 the gas that fills up the space of the country and that anything built in the name of fighting anti-racism should basically not elicit skepticism and should pretty much, you, you should support as a, as a way of saying that you are a, a person committed to racial progress and that that's, and, 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 uh, definitely a, a skepticism of any sort of any, any style of anti-racism that presents humanity first over skin color. And that, that really emphasizes the fact that, uh, race is skin deep and that concepts like whiteness and blackness are actually, actually fictions. That style of anti anti-racism is not in vogue. Um, and, and so there's, there's a problem where parents at certain schools, I, I have no idea how widespread it is. I, I think it's no doubt exaggerated by, by many people and, and you know, under exaggerated by others of teachers uh, who are compelled by the Kendi D'Angelo style of anti-racism, teaching it essentially as fact I've, I, again, I have no idea how widespread this is. I, I'm, and it's very difficult to, you know, I, I, I asked Christopher Rufo about this and he has anecdote after anecdote, which, which, uh, unfortunately doesn't tell you anything about how wide this could be a problem that less than 1% of people are experiencing. And it, it could be a problem that, you know, 10, 20% of parents are experiencing and, and I, I genuinely wouldn't know I, I don't have a strong intuition about how widespread it is, but there's a problem of just how, how you meet that challenge in a context where any individual parent is 
uh, especially parents that don't have the, the, the melanin force field as, as you, as to steal your term would feel, would, would, would be afraid to speak out or to, um, file a lawsuit and become the face of, uh, of this, of this fight. So you, you wrote an op-ed about this and maybe you could just go, go back to square one and, and talk about how you think about this problem in general and ways of combating it, including these, these laws that have cropped up. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think obviously there's a lot of terrain to cover as your, yeah. as your setup there um, indicates. I mean, to begin, like my own views on this stuff um, are that I am, I'm deeply concerned about race essentialism because I believe in the dignity of the individual. And I believe that in general, when it comes to matters of public policy, uh, when it comes to our ability to understand complex societal phenomena, the very best thing that we can do for ourselves is ensure that we are regarding people as individuals and, and contemplating the sort of complexity and nuance of the world around us. Um, and one of the worst things that we can do for ourselves is allow race to, to distract us, to obscure the truth, to not recognize it for the abstraction that it is and the various ways that it can kind of distort our perception. And over the course of the past year and a half or so, I mean, unless you've been living under a rock, like the primacy of race in our political discourse is something that has become self-evident um, and inescapable. We experience it every place. We see it in our, our public health policy in the midst of a pandemic. We see it in the context of conversations about criminal justice. Um, and virtually everything else. And it's no surprise that we also see it in K through 12 education. Um, and its manifestation in K through 12 education, I think has created a lot of appropriate concern. Um, and it's interesting, I think, to, to kind of juxtapose the way that that appropriate concern has manifested itself with the things that give me pause when I think about like race essentialism. Like the reality is I will routinely hear things like um, there's a genocide against black Americans uh, in America, that the police are, you know, killing black people every day. Mm. Um, these things are overstatements. They're, they're, they're not true. They're fundamentally untrue. And there's a sense in which to the extent you care about police involved shootings, having your perspective and your, your goals and the policy prescriptions moored in facts more than the truth is really, really important. And in much the same respect, when I read um, people who talk about these things, I will frequently, frequently encounter things like public schools. Um, and just I'll quote Chris Rufo here, because Chris and I now this has become kind of this personal disagreement in some respects. Mm -hmm. But public schools, which have the power of compulsion, are pushing toxic race, racial theories onto children, teaching them that they should be judged on the basis of race and must atone for historical crimes committed by members of their racial group. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Now, what percentage of schools are doing that? Is it every school? Is it 50% of schools? Is it 20% of schools? Is it 10% of schools? The facts matter here. And I think Chris will acknowledge that we don't know. Um, and as you've already acknowledged, but I think you'll also, I will also acknowledge that I get reports of this kind of stuff. Um, you, I'm sure, get reports of this kind of stuff. And Chris has obviously reported on a lot of this. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, what do you do about this? And I think if you're having a conversation where you presume it is everywhere at all times and it must be confronted everywhere, what does that sound like? Um, you're going to have one perspective on this. Um, but if you have a more nuanced perspective and you recognize that this is a problem that is broadly true of sort of society and it is a cultural phenomena that has, is impacting virtually every area where we live our lives, and that the manifestation in K through 12 in that respect is an extension of the broader cultural thing that's happening, then I think that ought to inform your strategy for confronting this. And the New York Times editorial is sort of born out of that sensibility. Um, you've got four people who disagree profoundly on a number of things, um, despite um, suggestions to the contrary, that there is not much difference ideologically between us. Um, and what we shared, however, was not so much a belief that these bans on critical race theory in public schools were a violation of free speech or that public schools are a marketplace of ideas. These are not claims that have been made, um, but more so that there is a particular purpose 
for an education in a liberal or free society. And I mean, I'm using liberal in the broadest kind of classic liberal sense of the word. And that purpose is incompatible with indoctrination, but it also demands something of us. And much of what concerns all of us is that the bands um, are a blunt instrument to try and achieve you know, this cultural goal. And in, in being a blunt instrument are likely to have a lot of unintended consequences. And that a better goal for addressing genuine concerns that people have, and the piece does not suggests that there aren't genuine concerns. It suggests that we have a difference of perspective on what these concerns might be. It says appeal to the courts where the most egregious things are happening, but also you have to do the very hard work of actually developing curriculums that aren't trying to sort of de-indoctrinate kids or protect them from being indoctrinated altogether by getting rid of particular bad ideas, but develop curriculums that really teach kids to have critical thinking skills, to be full and complete people, individuals, and to make our, our schools the personification of our ideals, places where kids are getting those critical thinking skills, where they're learning to navigate the universe of differences of perspectives that we have, which means that teaching the 1619 Project in school at any grade level as the definitive history of the United States is wrong and unacceptable. Bringing in Ibram Kendi and insisting that children take pledges that suggest that their whiteness or their blackness fundamentally defines who they are, again, also unacceptable. But in a similar way, trying to create a circumstance where it becomes impossible to discuss these ideas at all, to ask questions about them and probe them, um, is something that is also antithetical to our values. And we ought to be striving for something more. There is no simple, easy answer to this problem that I think Chris and you and I agree exists, that there are people engaged in kind of excess and hysteria when it comes to race essentialism in, in schools, that they are, they're pushing race essentialism in school. Um, but I don't want to pursue a solution that is impractical, that is imprudent, and quite frankly, that is, is not up to the task. It's inadequate to the task of actually fomenting the kind of cultural change that I want to see, a world where we prioritize the, the, the dignity of in, the individual over this nonsense idea of race essentialism, um, and where we prioritize making schools that actually function in a way to make kids critical thinkers, to ensure that they're critical thinkers, and to respond to the diversity of circumstances they find themselves in. I mean, these laws broadly ban K through 12, these things in K through 12. But of course, kids in kindergarten and first grade have very different needs than kids in, say, ninth through 12th grade. How can you have a civics class where it becomes impossible to talk about sort of white supremacy as a broader concept or systemic racism as a broader concept when, in fact, these are realities of our political discourse? You have to talk about this. I think it is, it is virtually, it's criminal. I can't even imagine a circumstance where you can't engage with the ideas of Nicole Hannah Jones in your high school civics class or ta Easy Coates, or for that matter, James Baldwin or MLK, who have had very harsh things to say about the United States, and in some cases have said things that probably run afoul of some of these laws. One, one of the struggles is that there are many different laws, and, and even within one law, there are, v- there are different clauses that that point in, in pretty different directions. So, so pr- pretty much all of the laws we're talking about have a clause that says something like you, you can't teach that one race is inherently superior to another. That's like, it's, it's fairly un- uncontroversial as a sentiment. Again, whether you want it in law is, I guess, a separate question. Not, it's not the center of the controversy here, right? The, th- then you know, other of the laws ha- specifically ban using the 1619 project as class material, um, which is again a, a very different kind of clause. Right? Like my my opinions on those two, uh, my feelings towards those two kind of clauses are, are totally different. And the fact that they're in the same law confuses my feeling about the law. Um, and then, you know, and then there's other there's other bans that w- within these laws that don't ban ideas so much as practices, such as segregating students by race. 
and, and then there's there's others that ban ideas that I that I'm just seem pretty ridiculous to ban. So like for instance, the idea that a meritocracy is racist or oppressive, right? Is um, you know, I, I it's, it's not my belief system. I don't think meritocracy is inherently racist or oppressive, but the notion that you couldn't teach that. Um, or, or couldn't explore that as one of, you know, many options. It seems like that seems in particular, you know, vague to an extent that would rule out a lot of, I, you know, vaguely left wing ideas that aren't crazy. Right. And, and, and aren't, uh, more importantly, aren't directed at individual students. Right? Like the, the, the parts of these laws that, um, that I really, I can totally see how they, they would be useful are, are things that prohibit a teacher from telling students specifically that they are less than, whether that is morally inferior or, you know, you are, um, you, you ought, you ought to feel guilty, Timothy, because you are a white man, right? Like a, a teacher or a white boy, you know, it could, it could even be that a teacher doing those kinds of things. It, it seems, you know, wh- whether or not it actually is the best way of f- fighting th- this ideology, I can certainly see the rationale for it um, as a way of banning a certain kind of teacher behavior that is, you know, belligerent and harmful to students, right? Like if, if the if the races were reversed, you wouldn't. I, I wouldn't want a teacher telling black kids that they're less than because they're black. Of course, you wouldn't even need to legislate that because probably in this day and age, just the culture would come down on them so hard, and people would feel no compunction, you know, filming their teacher and putting it on, you know. But in in a context where a, a rogue teacher is doing something like that to white kids. And the parents don't want this to become their life, don't want to become known on social media for this. It seems helpful to have laws that proscribe that kind of behavior. But then mixed in with that is, is a ban on certain texts, 1619 Project, a ban on certain ideas such, such, such as that the U.S. is systemically racist. Again, something I disagree with. But so, so I guess there's one conversation about the law's the, the so-called anti-CRT laws as they're written in various states. And then there's another conversation about, you know, the space of possible laws or actions that could make sense. Right. Um, and I, I think the laws as they're written have, have serious flaws and, and um, some that I've, I think j- just mentioned, but this, the, I, I'm not actually sure that I'm against a well-written law here. So like, like is, it, is it actually true that anything that could be written would either be too vague, so, so vague that it would prohibit a lot of good kinds of or healthy kinds of speech or too narrow that it, that it wouldn't do anything? I think in, in many respects, that is true. Um, I think the the thing to keep in mind from my standpoint is the milieu that the the push to pass these laws is coming out of. And the reality that what is being generated here is a hodgepodge of things, some of which are unconstitutional, many of which are in fact constitutional, because as we acknowledge in the New York Times piece, and as I've said on numerous occasions, like the the state has broad authority in the domain of K through 12 education. It is legal to pass these laws um, in many instances. Um, That isn't the question from my standpoint. Um, There are things that I do think are already prohibited by uh, federal civil rights law. Um, It is, I I think, and we already have challenges that are pending in the courts and that are working their way through different institutions with respect to segregating students by race. Um, It is already, for example, prohibited 
to suggest that people are inferior on account of their race. We have certainly seen cases where white people have won um, discrimination suits, federal discrimination suits. And we've got legions of institutions that exist explicitly for the purpose of helping parents, families um, file these lawsuits and get them adjudicated. And we have precedent um, because of the success of organizations like FIRE in terms of pursuing reform and change so socially through um, the courts in order to get um, remedies for people. Like we've, we've actually seen that work. So I think those are all, it, it's prudent to think about the specific ways that these laws are being enacted. Um, and it's also prudent to think about the societal consequence and the, the, the consequence for a political movement that begins to focus on these laws, these bans and restrictions as the principal vehicle for pushing back against what is a broadly, a broadly occurring cultural phenomenon where people are embracing race essentialism all over the place and imagining that merely by passing these laws, they can arrest this cultural trend. Um, and quite frankly, I, I'm not only is that not true, I worry that people will feel a sense of relief after having passed these laws. Um, I, I, I worry that places like Texas, for example, which is the reddest of the red states, and it's important to acknowledge that in most states in the, United, in, in, in the country, it would be impossible to pass these laws because generally speaking, you need a red legislature um, and probably you know red, red governor in order to really get these things through, despite the unpopularity of critical race theory, these laws are not broadly popular either. Um, but so that's one impractical dimension of this. But you also have places like Texas where, you know, in recent months, they've passed a critical race theory ban. Um, and it's not obvious how much of a problem that is in Texas. They've also passed um, uh, some sweeping restrictions on abortion that are pretty controversial. And in my estimation, are probably unlikely to stand and the one thing that they don't have is, say, like school choice reform um, that is statewide, that actually gives parents meaningful, dis meaningful authority to make decisions about where tax dollars are being directed. And I think that latter thing, that school choice thing, is actually a genuinely meaningful get stick, a cudgel that parents can use to direct resources and support and to make a choice that for themselves when they find that they're encountering things in their local school system that just are not working for them. And it might be critical race theory. It might also be that the schools are just not very good where they are and they want to be able to go to a charter school or go to a private school or just choose another school in a different district. Um, I think it's, it's very revealing that at a time when so many schools are profoundly underserving students, the conversation that we're having isn't about you know, how to make schools better overall, um, how to make certain that teachers unions and school boards are focused on delivering high quality results to students. It's a particular narrow kind of culture war issue and an argument that almost seems to implicitly suggest that the status quo was fine um, before this all became a thing. And I think that's very much not the case. Um, and again, I'd say that the, the New York Times editorial properly understood and read if you just just read the introduction and concluding paragraphs, is not about fundamentally like just free speech in schools. It is about a call to action, a, 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 an actual assertion that what we need is a better approach to education, one that is in line with our values as a free society, and one that respects the dignity of individual students and understands that they're being entrusted with the stewardship of our society eventually. And we ought to act accordingly. We ought to give them the education that they deserve. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, very unfortunate, quite frankly, like personal, like feuding that's erupted out of this. I think the very narrow conversation about critical race theory, you're, you're either for bans or you're for critical race theory. I think it's absurd. I think it's a false dichotomy. Um, and it, it, it evades a lot of the really important uh, challenges that have been brought up with respect to how likely these bills are to succeed. Um, and with respect to the very, to the numerous alternatives to banning ideas or trying to ban ideas um, that are on, on offer for people who are genuinely concerned about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, 
I mean, one one thing I've thought about uh, relevant to this is is the you know in this case it's it's the constitutional separation of church and state which the you know the court has multiple times ruled that you can't teach creationism as science although you you can teach it in other contexts and you know I imagine you know, what if the constitution just didn't have that clause and we had to reinvent it, you know, as state law. Now, I think it, it would probably be easier because it's in, in the context of biology, it's easier to, I would imagine it's easier to write laws banning specific concepts just because history and sociology are messy and less precise than, than biology and Physics, it would probably be even easy, even easier because it's you know, as as hard a science as it as it gets. Yeah. Um. But but nevertheless, you know, I'm I'm trying to look at this from the perspective of someone who, uh, like, someone who understands that these laws are not going to win the culture war. Um. But also feels that they actually can't do very much to help, you know, win the culture war because you know, they have the, the sort of typical level of bravery, which is to say not that much. They don't particularly want to become, you know, they, they don't have, they're not like me and you, they, ha- they don't have platforms and sort of don't want to be known for spearheading a, a criticism of, even even a well considered criticism of of critical race theory, and they understand that the laws are not, you know, they, they may not do all that much, may have only a small effect, but nevertheless support well written laws with the intent of, you know, keeping indoctrination out of keeping a specific kind of indoctrination out of out of public schools in the same way that I. I I th- I think I'm pr- pretty happy that you can't teach, you know, intelligent design. Um, just so is there is there a more limited case like no and th- this in your your point about that this is a part of the culture is is well taken and it's a point that I made to Rufo's like this is you cannot legislate away a what is essentially a war of ideas in the culture that's been percolating and and for decades and, and exploding in recent years, right? You can't, uh, it, it just doesn't work like that. And I, I even made the analogy of, you know, even with religion and, and atheism, my, I, I think, I, I wonder if you would agree with this, that during the, the era of the, the new atheists and the, the explosion during really the Bush and, and, and early Obama years, the explosion of online material and debates with Hitch and Sam Harris and Daniel Dennett and, and Richard Dawkins and all the best-selling books, you know, what, what actually did more to push the, um, the, the culture towards secularism broadly, probably all of that stuff. And the, the, you know, the millions of views that people just silently changing their mind, watching content, on YouTube, having conversations with their friends, in addition to, you know, the South Park and, and Family Guy, all of these shows that are kind of irreverent towards religion, right? like all of that stuff in the culture, I, I would argue had a broader impact than the fact that you didn't get indoctrinated in, in public school. Nonetheless, can't you make an argument that even though it's not... Uh, it's it's not going to win the culture war on this on this particular issue, it, like a well written version of it. You know, I, I I'm not going to be against you know a, a a narrow plan B just because it's it it's it wouldn't make a good plan A. You know, and then we can also do we can also have a conversation about how to in general approve American education and and all of the totally very valuable and important, more important things that you were just talking about. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the challenge. I mean, there's in an, in an ideal world, 
Absolutely. This narrow specific provision where you just pass essentially a state law that outlaws, say, the practice of splitting children up by race, you know, in their classrooms, which I think, again, kind of mirrors the federal statute, but that's fine. You focus on that. Is it actually possible to have this broader focus on the the universe of other things that are also important on the more fundamental, in my estimation, goal of improving the quality of education and recentering the individual in that process and making certain that we're focusing on developing and implementing curriculums and pedagogies that are consistent with our values and ideals? Is it actually likely that we're going to do both of those things? You may, I don't know that it's likely. Um, it might be possible, but at the moment, what's happening is there is a culture war. And it is a culture war that in some cases, you know, you have people who describe themselves as conservatives talking about themselves, you know, defending particular values. Um, but talking about this in like very like apocalyptic terms and placing at the center of their efforts um, this sensibility that we have to fight fire with fire. Um, uh, uh, I saw something yesterday um, that was making the rounds with a teacher um, in Iowa who was explaining that she has created a circumstance where she, she understands that the law prohibits her from teaching certain concepts. But one thing she'll do with her students, and I'm not sure what age they are, is to sort of present to them this, this law that is on the books now and review it with them and make clear to them that, you know, she can't um, talk about these things, but, you know, the students themselves are allowed to ask questions and they do ask questions and they do have conversations about this. And the response to this was, you know, outrage. She's circumventing the law. She is doing something that is completely unacceptable. Um, But it also seems to me, but it seems to me that there's something very obviously acceptable here. Like students in a public, a public school setting, like having a conversation about the law that exists in their state and asking questions about that law and having a discussion, the question becomes like how to do that in a way that is productive and that is consistent with our values, where there is some complexity and sophistication to that conversation. Not so much that there's equal time for all ideas, but that kids have the ability to turn those ideas over and engage with them in a meaningful way. Like that has to be the goal. But instead, the, the, the disposition now from some people who have advocated for these bans is this teacher needs to be investigated. And if she's found in violation of the law, terminated. Like, it's the uncertainty <laughs> and the hostility that is inculcated into the system by bans as a methodology for trying to improve and safeguard kids in this way. Broadly speaking, that, that's the principal instrument here. Um, that I think is actually a huge part of the problem. And at a time when our political disagreements and sort of sensitivities are very, very heightened at, at, a, at, a, at a serious peak, um, I think it's worthwhile to have people that are insisting that perhaps at the margins that we try harder to do the very difficult work. And I don't pretend that it's easy, but the difficult work of forging new curriculums that actually meet our goals of forging avenues for us to have serious conversations about these real issues that aren't going away, um, as opposed to imagining that we can bludgeon our opponents to death, that we can beat them out of the system, that we can just cl- close them out altogether, and that we can purify the temple. Um, that is, I mean, there's just a, a zealotry and kind of a reactionary, a reactionary nature to that that is anathema to traditional conservative values which were all about you know, a healthy skepticism of state power um, and depends instead on prohibitions to safeguard us. And I, I think the analogy to um, you know, evolution in public schools um, and creationism in public schools is a good one, but it's worth remembering that those debates began not with you know, people trying to prohibit creationism in public schools, but with people trying to outlaw evolution in public schools. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind that that's, that's where this began. And the reason that we don't do this is because evolution is a, a fundamental scientific concept that has particular implications for a broad cross-section of the sciences. 
Um, critical race theory, on the other hand, is a, a, biz- a bizarre kind of daunting patchwork of ideas. It's a spectrum of things and not any one thing. And prohibiting it is very daunting for that reason. Um, and quite frankly, just cannot be done successfully in my estimation. Yeah, that that's another problem with this is what's called a critical race theory ban is is a ban on a mix of things, some of which have very little to do with critical race theory, I think. I mean, there I mean I can see why it's been branded this way. It's not completely random, but it's um and and, last, and maybe um, and maybe you know, closing closing point, you know, it's it's funny. I've had conversations the, the New York Times editorial does not take aim at anyone in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, the New York Times editorial does not denigrate the concerns of parents who are, are finding themselves facing these really contentious issues in, in K through 12 settings. Um, it acknowledges that these issues exist and it lays out, I think, a meaningful game plan for trying to get things done here. And you know, while we've been castigated in a number of ways. And it's been asserted that we've misrepresented the legislation and that's been asserted forcefully. I actually heard it was asserted here uh, on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think the reality is what we tried to do there. Um, and it, and I think my, my good friend, David French on a recent episode of the fifth column, which folks can go back and listen to in their entirety. And they should, if they're like genuinely interested in what the other side of this conversation or, or great argument is, um, David has acknowledged that the piece probably should have um, included um, a, a particular phrase um, that made it clear that what we were talking about wasn't the specific letter of the law, but the actual implications of the law. Mm. That the reality is that even when you are saying that you know the law that parents or I'm sorry that teachers should not. Um, be instructing students that they should feel shame on a cons- as a consequence of their race or that particular concepts shouldn't be introduced in the classroom setting that make them feel shame as a consequence of their race. The reality is that this should, as, as a function of the way the law is necessarily going to be interpreted and the way that parents will interact with it, becomes uh, a may or a could because there are going to be differences of perspectives here. There's going to be uncertainty and ambiguity in the implementation and the execution and the prosecution of these cases. Yeah, I'm curious about um, that because that, that, was the, um, that, was the, that was the main source of confusion for me, reading, reading mm-hmm. the op-ed and then reading the laws is the, the, difference between, uh, the difference between you can't teach something that could lead, say, a white kid to feel guilty because he's white and saying that you can't teach that white children should feel guilty, right? Like that, that's the difference from reading the op-ed. I, I understood that the law said the first thing. And from reading the law, I understood that the law said the second thing. And the difference between those seemed, seemed cleaner to me than I think it, it does to, to you in French. Because right. I, and, may, and maybe really I'm, I'm more, thinking, more to David because I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> right. But like, to, to me, and, and I'm not a lawyer either. And I know he's dealing with um, the practical consequences of vaguely written laws, which is mm-hmm. at some level why lawyers exist and get paid so much is because <laughs> there is a constant fight over anything where there's any sort of wiggle room or interpretation. And I've I've signed enough contracts to understand, you know, just how persnickety you should be with, with language. Um, but, um, and, and maybe that's really the, the best case against that, that kind of law, uh, or that kind of wording. But it does seem to me that there's, I mean, it's like just teaching the facts of slavery mm-hmm. could, is enough to make a lot of white people feel guilty, for instance. Right teaching the facts of the Holocaust is enough to make a lot of Germans feel guilty. Just the neutral, basic bullet point facts of it. Um, and, and so, but, but actually what, what I, the, the way it was phrased, I really understood from that op-ed that anything that could lead to that w- was being banned. It could lead to feelings of guilt. Right. And, um, and I'd say that that's, that's probably, probably a bit of, of not even so much overstatement, but, a, a 
a lack of clarity on our part. And the reality, I think, is that when you have four people trying to write something together, <laughs> um, and in some cases, like very different backgrounds and levels of expertise, um, the kind of precision of the language around that was something that I don't even know that we had a lengthy conversation about it. I think we had a corporately an understanding that what we're talking about here are the implications of the law as they're put into place. Um, and quite frankly, like I was probably more concerned with the framing of the argument, like the presentation of two laws. I think we only get into two specific laws, but in the same piece, we say these laws are meaningfully different from one another and yeah. in general are probably legal. Um, the fundamental thing that the piece was about wasn't those laws, wasn't even the kind of individual inadequacy of any one of those laws. It was more on what kind of educational system do we want to have? And, you know, to the extent that's the conversation we're having, it, it's, it's frustrating to me that the, the principal issue that's been disputed here is whether or not we misrepresented the law. Um, I think that that is going to be a function of what actually ends up happening as things play out. And I think as they have played out with teachers um, finding themselves um, under investigation or even fired for doing things as, and, it, and it's hard to say what happens in a lot of these cases because oh, yeah. you know, so it's a I, local school board. That is what like, I blanked out stuff. that I wanted to talk about. Yeah. More. So I, I'm fascinated by this case of, of the teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I want to, I want to talk about what it would look like for things to go right, because I totally agree. We want teachers to feel like, to feel no, no, to feel like they are allowed and, and to even want to say words like white supremacy, systemic racism. We want te responsible teachers to raise these topics with kids. Right. Young enough that they are, that they are cognitively able to, understand them. I actually don't, I haven't thought about what age that would be. Right. But we want teachers to raise this and we want kids to think about them. And, um, you know, to the extent that any part of the laws are making teachers feel they can't do that, then I'm, I'm very much against that. But the, you know, the, um, it's interesting because, you know, the, the laws and this again gets back to the problem of vagueness in, in legal language. It's like the laws as I understand them may not be the laws as every teacher understands them, right? Like the, the, this, this teacher in Iowa understood the language of her law to mean that she could not raise the concept of systemic racism, but she could present the law to her class. And if a curious student says, Oh, what's systemic racism? Is America systemically racist? Then she was allowed to give an answer to to, to like answer to the to her heart's content in a in a way where she's saying things sort of as as truth. Is that the situation I mean, that that's was just it? Like it even in? even in the video, it isn't it isn't clear that her goal. It's clear. It seems rather clear to me, given the context, that she believes that, you know, systemic racism is a serious problem and that it's not just that kids need to be exposed to the idea. They need to understand why it's a serious problem. Uh -huh. But even in the way she explained it in the video, she seems to suggest that kids would have a discussion about this. Right. And that is precisely what I want. You yeah. know, I want it to be a nuanced discussion. I can't be there to, to sort of shepherd all of these things, but it, I think your point is well taken that, you know, what is a good, what is a good circumstance look like? Probably teachers and parents getting together and working through these kind of difficult, touchy circumstances, like at the local level, is it, is it really helpful for there to be kind of this blunt instrument of statewide law that doesn't respect the conditions on the ground in a particular school district and in a particular school and the relationship between parents and a particular teacher? Um, or is it possible that navigating these things kind of one to one in some respects um, and having a fund a, a real discourse between parents and teachers about kind of what's being taught in class and how it's being taught, where p teachers, parents can feel like they can raise their voice about these things and be heard? Um, is that not a better way to proceed here? 
And the reality is that, you know, public education, it's just, it's hard. It's something that is very difficult to get right. And I would say that across most of the country, we, we don't get it right in profound respects um, and systematically don't get it right. But to the extent there's a good version of it, I think it demands the engagement of parents in that way. And it demands a lot of local autonomy and control and probably demands that every single local issue between a teacher and a school board and parents doesn't become the next front in a national culture war where we just don't actually have the facts and can't meaningfully adjudicate whether or not what happened here is right or wrong. And I say that, and and I would say precisely the same thing about police-involved shootings. I don't think having the national conversation about police-involved shootings in the context of, say, Jason, Jason Blake, Jacob Blake's um, shooting is healthy. I think it, it necessarily distorts the conversations in ways that are deeply unserious. It, it makes people kind of rally to their sides and interpret things in a very motivated way. And as a result, we just end up not making progress. You know, we're minting new saints um, or minting new demons for conservatives to hate. And in many instances, we just, the critical issue of how should policing work in America? What does accountability look like um, for policing? And what's the best way to build trust between communities and law enforcement? That's a hard conversation. It demands nuance. It demands serious attention. And in much the same way, I don't think education is any easier. I think it's harder. <laughs> we have a long track record of getting it wrong. Um, and it's just going to demand a kind of rigorousness and seriousness that a hot culture war, us versus them, will use power and destroy them and bludgeon them and ensure that they can't have their evil ideas win. I, I don't think that that's a serious approach to these things either. Um, and I'm doing this hard work. People like Chloe Valdery are doing this hard work, a friend of ours, developing this curriculum. I've been consulting with a, a Montessori um, school, um, uh, school network and trying to have conversations about how you do this, how you develop pedagogy that respects the individual identity of students um, and navigates these difficult, complicated questions. And I think that's what we have to do in addition to finding the worst versions of this stuff and prosecuting it. If someone is, is doing things to your child, and it's not just white kids, I, I bristle at the notion that someone will tell my daughter that she's disadvantaged as a consequence of her appearance. It's, a, it, it's obscene that the, that the entirety of her society, of the country that she's, she's a citizen of, is arrayed against her and fundamentally racist in a, in a way that's immutable and, is, and inescapable. Um, it makes me angry, viscerally angry to imagine anyone trying to do that. I think that's... So, so, so what would you do if, you, if, if your daughter came home from school and just got the full... The, the full package, you know, the, that whole message, what, what would you do at a public school, assuming? I would do what my, what my mom did. And I suspect at some point your parents probably had to do something like this too, despite the fact that you're, or were almost certainly a brilliant student who never did anything wrong. You go to the school and you have a conversation with the school. You get involved, you raise hell, you ensure that you get answers about what happened, what transpired and how to make this better. The bottom line is there are no shortcuts. And I get it. I'm, I'm in the unenviable position of saying that the person who is promising you to change the world by banning the bad thing is giving you a, a promise that they can't, they can't actually fulfill. And my alternative is the hard, difficult work of getting your hands dirty and being thoroughly engaged and being brave enough to defend your values in your school board meetings and to your teachers and inculcating those values in your children so that when they go to school and when they encounter a teacher or a fellow student who has particular ideas, they have the ability to, to navigate those things and to cultivate beliefs of their own. And hopefully, you know, I hope that my daughter will, and it will buy my <laughs> arguments about the centrality, the centrality of the individual. Um, but to the extent that she doesn't, I, I desperately hope that she has a, a serious argument um, for why she disagrees with daddy and is prepared to level one and not merely buy into some kind of fundamentalist belief um, that, that she can't substantiate. I'm just now remembering that um, when, when my sister was in school, 
she had a history teacher, uh, I think it was maybe late middle school or early high school. And they were talking about slavery and uh, her, her teacher was white. And I can't remember what she said, but he, he, he kind of got angry and he said something like, well, if, if not for my ancestors, then your ancestors would still be picking cotton. He, he said he like got, he like went on a rant sort of in this way of um, a- asking her to feel gratitude almost for him. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that, that I'm imagining that sort of scenario in re- and what my parents did is they did exactly what you just described. They just went in, raised hell, asked for boundaries that were, uh, that were agreed to. And, you know, this teacher, you know, probably had some other problems as well. It's not the first complaint, you know, it rarely is. But I, I do, I, I do understand that, you know, why a parent might be hesitant to do that if they're white and their kid is white and let's say the teacher's black and listen, nine times out of 10, it's probably not a problem. You're not going to end up on Twitter um, or in a news article. And you should, you should understand that the fears of being canceled are, are exaggerated in, in, and I've talked about this on, uh, before on this show, how it's like prominent examples of people that get canceled, that get circulated in the news. The effect of that is, the, is to create the impression that it happens with, with a much higher rate than it actually does. Right. And it's that's inevitable. how that, yeah, that's how, that's actually how it works. That's the, that's the purpose of it. Just like the, you know, it's like hanging, like the scene in Pirates of the Caribbean. I always say when they're, when they hang like three pirates for all to see. The point of that isn't that we're going to catch you. We're probably not. The point is so you see it every time and fear that we're going to catch you because it's actually a substitute for widespread enforcement. Um, so so I, I would tell, totally... We should tell those success stories too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a pity that they don't, they don't get as much traction. The, right. the Coinbase story, the Shopify story, yeah. the Chick-fil-A story. Like these are all companies that still exist and are thriving despite the yes. fact they've had to deal with some some of these cultural headwinds within their institutions. Um, and yeah, I, I, bravery and courage are important. And calling no attention to people who are doing bad things systematically is really important too. Should castigate those people. Should, again, pursue lawsuits where it's appropriate. Um, but we should also be prepared to do the hard work, the heavy lifting of getting involved and making a difference at our local level, because it's, it's just, it's what's necessary here. If these values matter to you, if they really matter to you, um, then you have an obligation in my estimation to stand up for them and confidently proclaim them and defend them. And I I think one problem now is folks are, folks are anti, anti woke or anti-racist and they don't know what they're in favor of. They do not know how to articulate the affirmative values that they have. Mm. Um, and that is, I think, a very dangerous circumstance to find yourself in. All right. So I guess we can, uh, we can leave this topic for now. Uh, another, another topic, actually, I, I wanted to get your commentary on related to another recent guest that, I, that I've had is uh, gun control. Mm hmm. I know this is something that that you have thoughts on. I'm not even sure we've actually ever talked about this. Never, never. Um, is it? Is am I outing you as a gun owner? Is that? Do you talk about that ever? I, I talk about it. Yes, you do talk about it. Okay, I, and I've I've talked about it. I've talked about it in very. Um, in fact, I can remember during the early days of the pandemic when I retreated to Virginia. Mm. There is a, an episode of the Fifth Column where I'm like cocking my gun into the microphone um, for comedic effect, but also because you should know I got it on me. (laughs) I want you to know, I want you to know if you show up to try and raid my fridge, my Mm foodstuffs. Yeah, we got those things. Um, So yeah, no, I'm, I'm a, I'm a proud proponent of the second amendment. um, And I do believe in the right to bear arms and I defend that principle 
Um, I'm not the biggest gun nut in the world. Um, I don't have an AR-15 yet, but I would buy one um, and I would defend the right of an individual to own one. Um, and I, I appreciate all that comes with that, both for good and for ill. Yeah. So do, do you feel that it, it makes you safer? Um, that gun ownership makes you safer yeah. in general? Yeah. I think so. Yes. Um, but it's a question of kind of what, what kind of threats we're trying to safeguard ourselves against mm-hmm. in, in, in that context. You know, there's the, there's the state having a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, but does that mean that they should also have a monopoly on the legitimate ownership of firearms? Um, and to the extent that's true, you know, what are the limitations there? You know, should an individual be able to have like a nuclear, a nuclear reactor um, or a nuclear weapon or a tank um, or an AR-15 or a handgun? Um, and there are, I think, practical conversations to be had um, about a lot of that. Um, and then there's also just the reality that we find ourselves in, whereas we live in a country where there are lots and lots of guns in circulation. Um, and there's a culture associated with firearms in this country and a history associated with how we think about guns and our, our rights as individuals. Um, and it is very hard for me to imagine a circumstance where anyone were to sort of abolish the Second Amendment, get rid of the surplus of guns that are actually out there in the world as a practical limitation on what we might do from here um, and actually achieve a world where people are by and large much safer. Um, In many places, gun ownership is already illegal and criminals find ways to get guns. And the gun laws, the prohibitions on gun ownership serve to disempower law-abiding citizens and kind of give like this unilateral ability to use the threat of violence to criminals. And I think that that's probably not a circumstance that is by and large beneficial. Yeah. So I had David Hogg on maybe two months ago or so, and who is a, an activist, a, a gun violence activist, and uh, first became known as being one of the survivors of the Parkland shooting. And uh, we talked about all of these things and, and uh, you know, this is obviously a huge flashpoint in the culture, but one point I made is, is exactly the point you just made, which is just, it's, it's impossible in America to roll back the clock. Like we have a, a unique circumstance in this country that makes solutions in other countries unworkable here. For instance, the, the Australian gun buyback program, um, you know, seem to, to do pretty good things there. Although it's, it's, it's unclear whether the decline in mass shootings was a direct result of that policy or not. There's, there's papers on each side of that subject, Mm -hmm. but the, the idea that a mass gun buyback could work in America because it worked in Australia doesn't seem to follow. There's just are different circumstances with, with how many guns we have on the ground and the, just like the network of black market gun sales that's been entrenched forever. Um, yeah. But at and, the same time, the possibility of printing, printing firearms being oh God, a, a yeah. increasingly real possibility. Yeah. But, but at the same time, there are, there are some common sense, uh, you know, gun control measures that I think most sensible people would agree with. Um, and, and of course we have this perennial problem of terrifying lone wolf mass shootings. And, and then we have this separate problem of just the daily hum of gun violence in high crime neighborhoods. Um, and, and, um, the, the rest of the world looks on at, at what goes on in America with astonishment and horror, uh, and, and thinks what the hell is going on over there? Why, why don't they have their shit together? And on, on the one hand, I think we do have a, a gun culture 
that uh, or, or a, a big segment segment of the culture that is irrationally resistant to any common sense gun legislation. On the other hand, I think we have a set of challenges in this country that our peer countries don't actually face. Mm-hmm. And, and so shouldn't congratulate themselves on their very low levels of, you know, gun violence and, you know, you know, in, in a, in a, a t- you know, a tiny country where everyone speaks the same language and looks the same and has never even tried to welcome immigrants or diversity, uh, you know, kept their colonies abroad and then didn't let any you know, people of, of different races in small self-contained and, uh, you know, never had a, a massive, you know, network of black market guns. Okay. Give me that challenge any day and tell me that you're doing pretty good with gun violence and, and so forth. But don't pretend that's analogous to what America partly through policy and partly just through the circumstances of, of how we've evolved as a country, you know, our, our challenge is just t- totally different. Um, but what, I mean, what, what do you, what are you, what are the things you, you are thinking in your head when there's a, when there is a mass shooting and it's, it's on the news, what are the, what are the ideas that Camille thinks about that need to be uh, promoted slash are, are, are um, underrated in the culture, in the conversation? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. Um, and I, I agree with much of your setup there. Um, I mean, and interestingly, the reality is that when it comes to like gun crime, the majority of gun crime, it's between people who know one another, have some relationship with one another and generally kind of look like one another. So even like the, the unique challenges that are created by having such a diversity of people here in the country aren't really necessarily huge elements of the problem when it comes to the actual manifestation of gun crime in the country. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Well, I, I should have been more precise there. P- partly what I was referring mm-hmm. to is police and citizen interactions. Right. Right. And right. The, the paranoia on the part of citizens getting an arrest mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, and I think that's a, that is a, a, a very salient point. Um, but with respect to kind of mass shootings, um, one of the things that really stands out to me, and I've talked about this a little bit on the podcast before, and at some point I'll probably have more to say about this because this is, this is something that is very uh, personal for me as well, um, is that mental health um, is not something that we have very robust conversation about in this country. And oftentimes in the, in the aftermath of a shooting, uh, we talk about everything but that. We'll talk extensively about gun laws and prohibitions and in various instances are talking about prohibitions that probably wouldn't have prevented the particular crime from happening. Um, or we'll talk about, um, uh, I, I actually the gentleman in Atlanta who recently had that mass shooting last year, like we talked about anti-Asian bias, um, as like the motivating factor for his crimes. And it was the only thing that we talked about in some respects, despite the fact that it's turned out that that really wasn't a motivating factor for him at all. Um, And some people insisted that was the case without even having any evidence. But what is clear is that there was some severe mental anguish there. And there were some early warning signs. And there is probably a conversation to have about the relationship that he had with his church and the the number of resources that are available to family members who are genuinely concerned about someone who may do something violent. Um, And I think one of the things I'd really like to see us do in general is have a public conversation and discourse that acknowledges the challenges for families who have a family member who they fear might be a danger to themselves, might be a danger to others, and the complex range of emotions that individuals who find themselves in that circumstance have to deal with. Yeah. Um, I, I think what's, what's really necessary, perhaps above all else, is an appreciation for the difficult circumstances like families find themselves in when a member of their family, whether it's in their immediate family or extended family, is potentially a danger to themselves or others. Um, and the difficult range of emotions that you go through, the sense of guilt, the sense of disloyalty, um, the sense that you may be overreacting, 
these are profoundly difficult things for people to deal with. And we have to acknowledge that, that one of the places where we actually have an opportunity to interrupt a potentially horrendous situation where there could be a mass shooting is at that level. Um, and encouraging families to have like healthy dialogues with one another and making certain that there are resources for people to gain help um, and to access mental health services um, is something that I think is really important um, and that I would love to see us talk more about. I think it could help um, alleviate uh, the, the risk of mass shootings in school settings, but in a number of other contexts as well. Um, and it would also address what is another you know, fundamental source of violence in our society, which is just domestic violence um, broadly. We just need to be talking about these things more um, and do it in a more empathetic way, um, as opposed to a you know, binary political, like gun bans or no gun bans. And I think that's something that a lot of Americans can agree on. Um, that doesn't have, um, that could, but doesn't necessarily have a lot of the same baggage around, say, restrictions on the kind of handgun you can have or restrictions on the kind of ammunition you can have or restrictions that require, you know, keeping lists of who can do things and who can't do things. Um, but it has the real, I think, potential to have a, a, a meaningful impact on the likelihood of these things happening. I'm seeing the common thread in our conversation here is against brute force national or state bans of things and in favor mm -hmm. of localized face-to-face, -face, you know, communication and problem solving at the, at the source between people. That seems to be a common thread I'm seeing in, in your thinking. Is that, is that right? I'd, I'd say so. <laughs> I, I am, I, I'll out myself as a libertarian and an individualist and someone who believes that uh, on average, like we tend to get better outcomes when we're making decisions and we actually have the people who have local knowledge making those decisions. And that oftentimes we get led astray um, or make errors when we try to make things too top down. Mm -hmm. um, and at the, in the current moment we find ourselves in, I think we also have a proclivity to make things, you know, just horrible things get lost to politics. It, it becomes completely us versus them. Mm. And it becomes all about the tribal warfare. And the fact that we actually want solutions is lost to all of us. The fact that what we all want at bottom is a society where people have the capacity to meet their full potential and to to have something better for their children than they've had themselves. And I, I mean, it, it, it's rather obvious to me that we're at a moment where we need more people calling for that, um, where we need more people reaching across like partisan divides and having serious, sober conversations about things. And I will always, always, always be skeptical of hysteria and inclined towards people who are having constructive conversations and looking for nuance and looking for thoughtful handholds and getting my hands dirty, trying to fix problems um, at the local level and to explore like solutions first, um, as opposed to you know keeping scorn on the horrible bad people, um, because I think that that's a it's a better way to to do things. I think it's more productive. I think it's healthier, um, and it makes me feel better. I'm exhausted by the culture wars, Coleman. To tell you the no, honest I, truth, I really I'm am exhausted too. by yeah. most of these conversations about race. Mm -hmm. um, I, I desperately want us to get beyond this sad, rather kind of pathetic epoch mm -hmm. that we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. where we're constantly virtue signaling, where people are sort of cowardly, um, cowardly, <laughs> being cowardly and not speaking up for and advocating for their values and believing all of the most kind of pernicious and excessively hysterical things. I just, we're better than this. I think we can be. Um, I have to believe that. So. Yeah, I believe it too. And uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I have to let you go, but I think that's a great sentiment to end the podcast on. And I would love to have you back again. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been great to chat as usual. Always good to talk with you, brother. Always good to talk with you. Yeah. All right. Be well. Later. If you appreciate the work I do, the best ways to support me are to subscribe directly through my website, colemanhughes.org, 
and to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you'll never miss my new content. As always, thanks for your support.